industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. This video was a difficult one to make, but it was something that was a long time coming. It is a video essay, but bear in mind it's under 18, well, under 19 minutes long, should I say. I think it's pretty good to say the least, but I want to thank my friend DK for narrating the video and I really couldn't have done it without him. DK, thank you so much. It really means the world to me that you've narrated this video. And without further ado, I will leave you in this case of Smith and Andrews. What happened to them and what were their final fates? If you watch James Cameron's movie of the same name, the 1997 production featured the final moments of the two men. The first man, Captain Edward J. Smith, was last seen inside the wheelhouse, going down with the Titanic like a captain out of duty. The second man, one of the Titanic's designers, Thomas Andrews Jr., was last seen in the first class smoking room, overlooking Norman Wilkinson's painting of Plymouth Harbor, standing silent and lost. Although it's claimed that these last moments were true, however, unfortunately, it's a work of fiction. Over the years, various accounts have been brought forward which would give different insights into the final moments of the two men. In this video, we are going to narrow down survivor testimonies and put pieces together of what could have happened to the men. Captain Edward J. Smith Captain Smith's final moments were perhaps the most talked about subject within the Titanic community. From the testimonies in the aftermath of the disaster to historical books like On a Sea of Glass, it is unclear what happened to Smith. Despite the accounts about Smith going down with the ship, the first theory of going down with the ship after stepping into the wheelhouse is a myth. The likely theories are jumping overboard before the Titanic broke up into two pieces and jumping overboard after pushing either a woman or a child on board the upturned collapsible B before either going under or swimming towards the boat before he was turned away. However, Another theory has come forward when an anonymous pastor claimed that Smith went under the water after being knocked over by a wave twice before going under a second time. Although they are separate, this is likely that rather than staying inside the ship and being knocked over by a wave, Smith went under after jumping into the water. But what happened beforehand? To answer this question, let's begin to look into the surviving accounts from those who were believed to be closer to the bridge where the captain was reported to have been seen. The closest people to witness Smith's last moments were junior wireless operator Harold Bride, saloon steward Edward Brown, trimmer James McGann, and first class passenger Robert Williams Daniel. Starting the last sighting of Captain Smith was from the testimony of Cecil Fitzpatrick. When the ship was beginning to make its final plunge, Fitzpatrick recalled that the captain and Thomas Andrews were on the bridge having a conversation on the port side of the Titanic. I then went for it on the port side, and I was passing through the bridge when I saw Captain Smith speaking to Mr. Andrews, the designer of the Titanic. I stopped to listen. I was still confident that the ship was unsinkable, but when I heard Captain Smith say, We cannot stay any longer, she is going. I fainted against the starboard side of the bridge entrance. After some minutes, I recovered sufficiently to realize that unless I got into a boat or swam for it, there would be no chance of being saved. I then went to launch one of the collapsible boats, which had been eased down off the top decks on the starboard side. We found when we tried to swing her in the davits that she was wedged between the winch of the davits and the spar, which helped to ease her down from the lower decks, which is the deck below the boat deck. After he had heard these words from the men, Fitzpatrick fainted against the starboard side and when he regained consciousness, he found himself on top of collapsed boat lifeboat B. However, Fitzpatrick mentions that Captain Smith remained on the bridge and he and Andrews ran past him before possibly going overboard. Although the account of the men's conversation has been accepted in the book On a Sea of Glass, these two accounts have been brought into question. Are both of them true or which is false? It's likely possible that Fitzpatrick couldn't remember what happened since he lost consciousness between seeing the captain and Andrews and climbing on top of collapsible B. Which one or both is true, we might never know. After he parted ways with wireless operator Jack Phillips, 
Harold Bride recalled the last moments of Captain Smith during the U.S. inquiry. Speaking with Senator William Smith, Bride said that he saw Captain Smith on the bridge while launching collapsible B before it toppled above him. However, Bride claimed that the captain went overboard with no life belt on from the bridge before the final plunge, though he didn't say if the Titanic broke in half during this time frame. When he was questioned during the British inquiry into the disaster, Edward Brown told Lord Mersey that while working on collapsible lifeboat A, he saw Captain Smith going past a group of men who were trying to launch the boat on top of the officers' quarters. With a megaphone in his hand, the captain said, Well, boys, do your best for the women and children and look out for yourselves. He then walked away towards the bridge. However, the closest interaction with the captain was trimmer James McGann when the pair got a hold of children. He took one of the two little children who were on the bridge beside him. They were both crying. He held the child, I think it was a little girl, under his right arm and jumped into the sea. All of us jumped. I jumped right after the captain that I grabbed the remaining child before I did so. With McGann standing next to the captain at the time, this may be the likely fate. However, his testimony continues in the water, but we will get to that shortly. Robert Williams Daniel, who was also on the bridge at the time of the sinking, gave a short account of the captain. I saw Captain Smith on the bridge, my eyes seemingly clung to him. The deck from which I let was immersed. The water had risen slowly, it was now to the floor of the bridge. Then it was to Captain Smith's waist. Then I saw him no more. He died a hero. However, since Daniel's story on how he left the Titanic is a mystery, his testimony is debatable. While the testimonies of Smith jumping overboard are strong, the testimonies from Antrimiter Isaac Hiram Maynard and Fireman Harry Sr. show that instead of jumping overboard, Smith was washed away from the bridge and swam alive in the water. All these testimonies came from the men when they swam and climbed on top of collapsible lifeboat B. Mater describes in full detail what happened when the water rushed over the Titanic's top deck and he had to swim towards the collapsible lifeboat. I saw Captain Smith wash from the bridge and afterwards saw him swimming in the water. He was still fully dressed with his peak cap on his head. One of the men clinging to the raft tried to save him by reaching out a hand, but he would not let him, and called out, Look after yourselves, boys. I do not know what became of the captain, for I could not see him at the time, but I suppose he saw him. In his testimony, which was later published in the Times newspaper, Senior said he saw the captain swimming towards the lifeboat with a child in his arms before handing it over to a steward. The captain was swimming with a baby in his arms, raising it out of the water as he swam on his back. He swam to a boat, put the baby in, and then swam back to the ship. Senior said that he had also picked up a baby, but it died from the cold before he could reach the boat. However, an unnamed trimmer claimed that the captain refused to get onto the lifeboat when the occupants tried to get him onto the boat. We pulled Captain Smith on, but he was washed off. We pulled him on again, but he said, let me go, boys. And that was the last I saw of him. While these stories seem plausible, Captain Smith's final moments likely became main witnesses to the men who were on top of of or launching collapsible lifeboat B. These scenes which involve Smith's final moments show that this upturned lifeboat has become an important part of history, more than lifeboat 6 or 13 and 15. With Smith's final moments already drawn up, we ask ourselves a second and different question. What happened to Thomas Andrews Jr.? Thomas Andrews Jr. Knowing the vessel from back to front, Andrews would be the one to say that Titanic will founder. Unlike Captain Smith's final moments, Andrew's final moments are foggy. Romanticism has sugarcoated the reality of what could have happened to Andrew. The main resource for this comes from a surviving account by Stuart John Stewart. Andrews was in the first class smoking room, standing in front of the fireplace with his arms folded, overlooking the painting of Plymouth Harbor by Norman Wilkinson. Once he saw him, Stewart asked Andrews, Are you going to have a try for it, Mr. Andrews? Andrews remained silent and Stewart left him, never to be seen again. However, in recent times, this myth has been debunked because Stewart left the Titanic in lifeboat number 15 half an hour before Andrews' last confirmed sightings. Another debunked theory came from the 2022 documentary Titanic, Titan of the Sea. In the documentary, it is believed that Andrews was indeed in the first class smoking room, but he might have been processing the events that were occurring. 
since the documentary mentioned Stewart's accounts, this meeting between the men is now outdated. Somehow, it is theorized that Andrew snapped out of his trance and ran to the boat deck throwing items like deck chairs into the ocean. He then grabbed a life belt before running to the bridge. This was when he met Smith before the two jumped overboard. Again, the men jumping off the bridge together is outdated. However, the theories that could have been possible came from various anonymous testimonies, which include passengers witnessing Andrews on the boat deck, passing life belts to remaining passengers on board, throwing deck chairs into the water, and walking towards the bridge whilst carrying a life belt. Another theory of Andrew's final moments is reported from greaser Alfred White, who claims that Andrews went down to the engine room near the end of sinking, where he was trying to keep the lights going with Chief Electrician Peter Sloan, William Parr, and Archie Frost. However, this is believed to have occurred in the early stages of the sinking, around 1 a.m., before Andrews went into the smoking room. In a letter to the Reverend M. Langley, dated June 21st of 1912, White has said that he came across Andrews during the early stages of the sinking. Andrews suggested to the electricians that if they stayed any longer, they wouldn't be able to reach lifeboats. Instead, the men have been reported to have replied, we'll stay as long as we can. White continues to say that he and Parr were with Andrews in the main light room inside the ship at 1.40 a.m., mistaken for 12.40 a.m. They were at the switching center before Andrews joined the men at 1 a.m. I was on watch at the time, and he said to me, we are going to start one more engine. According to this plan, remaining steam pressure stored in the aft boilers could be used to run the turbine for electrical generation, the light room, and the Marconi shack sound room also had acid batteries for supplemental emergency power. I generally did that job, the starting of the generators. They went to the main switchboard to change over. However, the main theory on Thomas Andrews Jr. was that he jumped overboard with the captain. The two pieces of evidence that support this case come from the testimonies of mess steward Cecil Fitzpatrick and David Galloway. Galloway was a friend of Andrews, but he never traveled on the Titanic. However, he was in New York interviewing a few crew members and wrote a letter to Andrews' uncle, Lord Pierre. Following the U.S. inquiry, he traveled from New York to Southampton with a few members of the Titanic's crew on board the Lapland. From various accounts written by Galloway, crew members have spoken about how Andrews was last seen throwing deck chairs and other objects into the water. Galloway also wrote an account from a young mess boy who described the last moments of the men. Near the end, a young mess boy saw Andrews and Captain Smith on the bridge. The mess boy said that he saw both Andrews and Smith put on light belts and heard Smith tell Andrews it's no use waiting any longer. The boy also recalled that when the bridge became a wash, both Smith and Andrews entered the water. In a similar account, mess steward Cecil Fitzpatrick said the captain told Andrews the Titanic was going. This is the same account that we've looked into earlier. Conclusion While we don't know what happened, we could theorize about the fates of the captain and the ship's designer based on the accounts that are mentioned in the video. Now that we have looked into them, it's time to share these theories, which could be the closest we can get to the last moments of Captain Edward J. Smith and Thomas Andrews Jr. At 11.40 p.m. on the night of April 14, 1912, the White Star liner, the RMS Titanic, struck an iceberg in the middle of the North Atlantic off the coast of Newfoundland. Fifteen minutes after the incident, Captain Smith was seen going towards the engine room while Thomas Andrews was going back and forth to the mailroom. Smith somehow joined Andrews in the mailroom before going their separate ways for the first time. After Smith returned to the bridge, he ordered the lifeboats to be uncovered. Forty-five minutes after the collision, Andrews learned about the flooding in boiler room number six, the four-peak tank, and the second to fifth watertight compartments and was seen rushing up the grand staircase from D to A decks. Captain Smith was on the bridge when Andrews arrived, and by approximately 12.25 a.m., Andrews told the captain and Titanic's other crew members that the Titanic will founder. Not long after the break news to the captain and the crew, Andrews went down to the switching center in the engine room where he met Chief Electrician Pierre Sloan, William Parr, and Archie Frost. The men tried to keep the lights going on. While doing so, Andrews told the electricians, if you stay any longer, you won't reach lifeboats. Instead, the men replied, we'll stay as long as we can. 
At 12.40 a.m., the first lifeboat, lifeboat number 7, was launched on the starboard side. When number 7 was launched, Andrews went on the starboard side where he helped to assist women and children into lifeboats numbers 3 and 5. Both boats were launched between 12.43 and 12.55 a.m. Around the same time on the boat deck, Captain Smith was heard calling passengers to go down to A-deck as the lifeboats would be launched there. At 1 a.m. on the port side, Captain Smith alongside Chief Officer Henry Wild and 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller were assisting women and children before launching lifeboats number 8. Smith had a megaphone in his hands where he gave the order of women and children first. At around 1.30 a.m., Andrews went into the smoking room. It was at that time before John Stewart bumped into him. This was where he saw Andrews before asking him, Aren't you going to try for Afterwards, Stewart left the room and got into lifeboat number 15, which had left at 1.35 a.m. 20 minutes later, Andrews snapped out of his trance and went through the grand staircase and out onto the boat deck on the port side. He started throwing deck chairs into the water before he went aft and stayed on the starboard side of the ship. At 1.45 a.m., Smith and Wild launched lifeboat number 2 on the port side. Smith still had a megaphone in his hand, where he continued to call for women and children to enter the boat. At around 2.10 a.m., Andrews and the captain may have met one more time before they went their separate ways. Andrews then went overboard into the water. It's not clear what time he disappeared. At 2.15 a.m., the captain was seen walking past a group of men who were trying to launch collapsible lifeboat A, which was on top of the officer's quarters. With a megaphone in his hand, the captain said, Well, boys, do your best for the women and children and look out for yourselves. Smith bumped into trimmer James McGann on the bridge where they got a hold of children. He had a little girl under his right arm while having tears in his eyes. The captain and McGann jumped from the bridge wing. He was spotted swimming in the water and found a nearby lifeboat where he held the baby to passengers before he swam back to the ship. When he tried to do so, Smith must have spotted another baby and after seeing the lifeless baby, he swam to classable lifeboat B. Once the baby was passed to the occupants on the upside down lifeboat, a few of them attempted to pull him on board. Smith was washed off. When attempting to pull him again, he said, let me go, boys. Smith was never seen again. Although we cannot say for certain, the mysterious fates of Captain Edward J. Smith and Thomas Andrews Jr. have fascinated historians for years. With these latest theories, these possible events could fit the missing pieces of the puzzle. What do you think of these theories? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.